Eleanor Fox, thank you very much for, for joining us and for agreeing to, to discuss uh, the, 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 the most vibrant, and most dynamic issues in, in the development of competition law and economics. You've been advocating more so, somehow societal account of, of, of antitrust policy, which uh, was trying to be kind of uh, developing a, a moderate criticism towards the dominant uh, law and economics uh, perception, consumer welfare focused, myopic, perhaps reductionist vision. And now when pretty much uh, the majority of, of, of antitrust thinkers are gradually turning to this or uh, turning back from this, uh, you know, narrow um, axiomatic perception of, of the discipline towards more, um, you know, open to other uh, values, interests, and methods as well. Um, I wanted to ask you, how do you see the development of the field? Probably it depends on jurisdiction, but maybe in, in, in a purely theoretical sense. Is it, uh, do, do we move too little, just about right, or maybe we're, we're moving too quick? So thank you very much, Olesk. And it is very nice to be here with you today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, yes, you have asked a really global question. Um, how do I see in effect the future of antitrust in terms of its goals and the values that it accepts within it? Uh, so let me start talking a little bit about how this debate developed I'll focus a bit on the United States, and I certainly also want to focus on the rest of the world. And this is really a very basic debate about what antitrust is all about and what it should be all about. And as you say, uh, it seems in the last, um, you didn't put a number of years on it, but in the last six years, say, um, it seems in the world conversation, uh, to have moved from a narrower view of what antitrust can do, sometimes called consumer welfare, and more robustly called making markets work, um, to a more flexible view of what antitrust should do. Uh, so to take it first from the United States really quickly, you know, our big law was passed, Sherman Act was passed in 1890, and very vague as to what it was for, but it was very clear from the legislative history that it was against raw corporate power. It was against power and it was for those who were the victims of power. And in US, we left it for the courts to interpret what the words of the statute meant. So going very fast forward in the 1960s, our antitrust law was very much a law of economic democracy, helping the little guy. And it did become overprotective of small firms so that there was criticism from the Chicago school that became very vibrant in the 1970s and 1980s. And that criticism actually won the day to say our law was too soft and it was too mushy and we were, didn't have economic underpinnings and the right underpinnings were what we often call Chicago school. And the right way to think about it is antitrust should not usually even come into the picture unless the plaintiff, which might be one of the federal agencies could prove that the conduct or transaction was reducing consumer surplus and and limiting output. I should even say limiting output more than reducing consumer surplus because it was about allocation of resources to their best use. And if a transaction or conduct did not do that, the idea was antitrust would stay out and let the market work. That was the reductionist view of antitrust. And it came into US jurisprudence in 1980s with the Reagan administration. And then it was very vibrant as the religion of antitrust until we in the United States saw the growth of what we now know as the Neo Brandeis School, um, which said, look at all this corporate power aggregating around us and harming us in so many ways, some of which are tangible and so many 
intangible also like control, uh, weakening our democracy. Um, and the Neo Brandeis School got real roots in the United States. It especially got roots during our presidential elections, our past two presidential elections, and especially the last one presidential election of 2020, um, when the Democratic Party was partly like Elizabeth Warren running on the idea that we have to break up the monopolies, break up big tech and use antitrust as an instrument to make the economy work for the people rather than for the elite. And the way that was framed, as you could see, it brings in the idea of inequality is actually an antitrust issue. That's an anathema to, to Chicago school. Uh, so with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders taking this point of view, um, it became a very vibrant point of view in the United States. But I say point of view because it's not our law now. And unless our law is actually changed by legislation, um, our law remains the narrow view. So meanwhile, and I'm talking now, let's say about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, um, US used to be the gold standard of antitrust in the world but it started to lose its resonance. And Europe, for example, got hugely more resonance with the rest of the world in terms of how to think about the goals of antitrust and what antitrust could do and should do. That was in large part stemming from unilateral conduct, which means dominant firm conduct, monopoly firm conduct, or even powerful firm conduct where in the US law, there's very little control over it because there is a very, very strong assumption that even the monopoly firm has huge power to do what it wants to do and should because um, the idea is that will lead to more innovation. And that if you handicap firms, even monopoly firms by duties, you're going to chill their incentives to innovation and there are many people in the United States who still believe this and who believe, for example, that all the legislation that is pending should not pass because what the legislation is trying to do and what the left is trying to do is to cripple American industry. And, and that group of people will say it's because US has such little regulation, including antitrust regulation, that we, US, have the biggest high tech firms, we have the most technology, <clears throat> we're the ones who are doing the invention for the world. There are a lot of faults in what I said. What I said is not all true. Some of it has big faults um, and it's mostly point of view. It's, there's some empirical evidence one way and the other way and the evidence on what leads to most innovation does not go all that way. I mean, uh, uh, there's also a point of view that you really need good incentives for the firms that are challenging the dominant firm. Uh, so in the United States today, there are still most, I would say most antitrust experts say consumer welfare is the goal. They mean some different things by consumer welfare. Um, from on the far right, which also is least intervention, uh, they mean what I said at the outset, don't bring a case unless you can prove it will cut out, cut back output and misallocate resources. Um, and even Bob Bork in his book used consumer welfare to be total welfare, not just consumers. And this is a total welfare concept. Um, and then at the other extreme, still saying consumer welfare is the goal, you have a number of individuals who in our language, US terminology, you would say progressive, who are saying, yes, consumer welfare is the goal, but they mean helping consumers as people, as well as allocating resources better. And if they are clinging to consumer welfare, which 
most in the US are, um, they basically are saying social goals are not for antitrust to look at and take care of. So we're not trying to get antitrust involved in sustainability or inequality, unless it happens to be a byproduct of good enforcement that will help consumers. Um, this group of people incidentally also do believe in labor markets and enforcement in labor markets. And so I think inconsistently, even though they say it's for consumers, they will also say, yeah, you have to look at labor markets and the labor markets have to work. I actually think that th this group of people would be better off saying the terminology shouldn't be consumer welfare. It should be making markets work. Uh, and they should be saying, and if that's their point of view, we don't want to look at anything else that's not making markets work. And it could be sustainability and it could be inequality. Um, and it could be jobs, like getting jobs, preserving jobs, preserving um, jobs that are obsolescent, for example, they would not want to consider workers' rights. So then in the United States, you have consumer welfare being used both from the far right and the progressive left. And then there shouldn't be a clear break, but somehow there is now Neo Brandeis, which says, um, and that trust should be flexible. It's against power. It is the tool we have against power. When you're looking at business and business power, that is our tool and we just ought to use it. So what I see happening in, in Europe, for example, is uh, the use, sometimes the use of the word consumer welfare, but not as the one or be all of antitrust. Making markets work, market process, is recognized as a goal, a very important goal of antitrust. And now we see increased flexibility for taking on issues such as sustainability and sometimes inequality, saying these are the two existential challenges today. We cannot turn our eyes to them. And people think differently about how they should be incorporated, but not usually whether they should be incorporated. See also a, a very interesting play in terms of the kind of conduct and sometimes structure that antitrust ought to address. In Europe, both in the UK and in EU and in Germany, um, they are questioning whether even dominance is too high a threshold when you're talking about whether conduct should be reprehended and it's not a cartel conduct, it's a single firm conduct. So you in Europe are developing some different vocabulary and using some additional regulation um, to get at firms that have strategic market power and uh, power in markets across borders that it can be leveraged across borders. Uh, so this is through like ancillary regulation, like the DMA in the EU. And, and in Germany, its amendment, it's Article 19, uh, allows the antitrust laws to capture such power. And I, I should mention distribution because that um, the way I set out the narrow Chicago school scope for antitrust, it's not at all about distribution. It doesn't care about distribution. And in fact, if you run the whole continuum in antitrust to the progressive left that still says consumer welfare, they're usually saying distribution is not our problem. Um, we're not talking about fairness in the distribution. We're only talking about allocation of assets. And so it turns out that distribution is a huge problem in the world, that the, this is the inequality argument and the growing inequality gap, gap, that the elites get a huge share of the gains of almost everything from both the transactions and even the antitrust and the decision to not use antitrust. Um, they get a huge share of the gains 
the poorest people don't. I mean, the poorest people eke out a really, really small share of the gains, and some of them are even the losers. And the US antitrust law says, oh, don't look at who are the winners and the losers. And the world is saying, you've got to look at who are the winners and the losers, because this is one of our existential problems that, that the rich, the well-off, the well-positioned, they don't have to be very rich, but they have to be well-positioned. It could be through education and skills. They're getting the huge lion's share of everything. And the people who are less well-off are getting some part of it and then sometimes are, are just absolute losers as well as relative losers. Uh, all right, let me ask you then, Eleanor, um... It, it becomes clear that the pendulum, from normative point of view, the pendulum is moving towards this more pluralistic, perhaps, perception of the goals of competition law from the monocentric. And um, let me ask you a question about methodological uh, uh, consequences or implications. Um, I understand that obviously we, we can have more enforcement, we can design new tools via regulation per, by, by, by doing kind of more proactive uh, regulatory uh, shaping of competition policy. But from purely methodological point of view, it appeared to be that economics, neoclassical economics, was this kind of common denominator which unites uh, you know, establishes purely kind of universe. I don't want to say the word global because globalism can be fragmented. Purely universal uh, picture of measurement and uh, kind of neutral, distilled from any uh, blurring and any impact. We, we can read it between the lines. Uh, purely, you know, scientific based approach. And now it's in, in, it's, it's in decline. But do you think it, that we, we should be careful with not trying to kind of to abandon it outright with our enthusiasm to what would be a kind of a, a, a substitute to, 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 to law and economics? Is there in something on the horizon or should we be more moderate in trying to calculate incalculable pretty much? Uh, what is your methodological uh, recipe for this? So that's really a great question. And so this is my answer. Um, that we're not giving up law and economics. And law and economics is vital. And two things about it, though. The economics we have been using, especially in the United States, but not as much in Europe, has very basic assumptions that markets work and free markets work built into the models that the economists use. There's a very heavy weighing on the side of laissez-faire because of the assumptions. The markets work. It's very hard to make the markets not work unless the government comes in. Um, and the government, as antitrust enforcer, knows so little about business. They're coming in and they'll mess it all up. So these are all part of premises that are built into the economics, and they've got to be taken out. They're not built so much into the economics as applied in Europe although there's this very interesting phenomenon that the economics and antitrust profession is pretty global. So you'll get a lot of convergence of what the economists will say um, and the assumptions they'll build into their model. But there should be more transparency that this is happening and has in the United States and that the assumptions should be changed. That, that there's, and actually in Europe, um, there's a factual reason the markets actually work less well than in the United States. The capital markets are not as good. And so actually that should be built into the basic economist assumptions. And then, and then you put in the economic assumptions and build the model and you want to, if it's a merger, you want to predict the results. Um, and Prediction, of course, is difficult, but assumptions and prediction are important. And here's where winners and losers come in again. There's no reason why the economics shouldn't break out. So this is, these people will probably gain, these people will probably lose. The market workings, they'll have to describe, but the market will work as robustly or less robustly. There might be more incentives for innovation or there might not. These are all economic questions. And in the end, who are the winners and who are the losers should be broken out. And I'm not saying that who are the losers should always prevail. 
But once the information is systematically broken out, we can think what we want to do. Um, it, it might be that some transactions that look very ambiguous and you see, oh, but it's only the elite who are winning from it. You might want to say it's illegal. Um, on the other hand, if a transaction actually is welfare enhancing on the whole and, and there are losers, you might think we should think about how, what to do for the losers. I mean, do the losers need something like job training, um, especially something market friendly? And we're covering up that information because the economists say it's irrelevant. And then you can have trade-offs. I mean, once you have that information, you can see, or a jurisdiction can decide. So if you put sustainability into the equation and sustainability can cut in different directions too. I mean, actually sometimes the transaction will be good for um, getting rid of greenhouse gases. And sometimes um, a transaction will actually be more polluting like I think Bayer Monsanto was actually more polluting and a huge merger and the effect on the environment was not even taken into account. And the effect in developing countries and developed countries was totally different because the developing countries were the big losers. And all of this was covered up. There were a lot of spinoffs uh, in each nation for what's good for the consumers of that nation. And that's the end of it. That's the absolutely wrong way to think about such a huge merger that has such power over our lives. Okay, you, you started talking, or you, you, you already ex, you know, articulated a few ideas about winners and losers and also development. So it gives us a nice you know, uh, avenue to, to, to discuss this issue in more, de in, in more detail. Uh, so we have uh, two aspects. Uh, competition law and development and competition law and the digital uh, sector. So let me start with the first one you mentioned by Monsanto. Obviously in, in, you know, in the previous, uh, from the previous paradigm point of view, we can evaluate mergers based on pretty much uniform standardized criteria. And obviously we understand that the, usually the main beneficiaries in this, uh, uh, from, from this matrix are uh, the, the, the jurisdictions from which the merged parties are coming from, mainly the, the, the most mature, advanced, economically advanced jurisdictions, trendsetters, let's, let's put it this way. Now the, the pendulum is moving. Um, and now we see the, new, uh, the newly converted jurisdictions trying perhaps to massage their uh, newly, uh, the new understanding of competition law, trying to be a little bit um, too uh, creative in the interpretation of, of what is kind of canonical for uh, It was too canonical, too orthodox perhaps, but it was still you know, robust and reliable. And some jurisdictions show examples how they try to interpret these provisions. Um, again, relying normatively on quite solid uh, logic saying that, look, we are uh, worse off our industries will be worse off. So can you please, we approve the transaction subject to the requirements which are rather unusual for mature jurisdictions. Is it a trend or it's just, you know, some rare examples and what would be your, you know, theoretical um, let's say, uh, explanation of, of, of this situation? Is it side effect or it's kind of growing pain? Oh, so I think this is not a trend, at least, for outside of US, but also it's in incipiency. I think there's a lot of thinking and intellectual leadership and whether it will get into the law or not, I'm not sure. Um, and a reason why it might not get into the law like consideration of sustainability um, is because it's against the interest of powerful lobbyists or against the interests of say US, which is the host of the companies, at least one of them in Bayer Monsanto, um, that's gonna win from it. Uh, so I, I'm afraid that there are powerful moneyed incentives not to move in a direction that I think would be better for the world. Um, but I, I don't think these arguments are going to go away. 
I think, for example, U.S. would see it as altruistic and not something we want to spend our money on or give up the benefits of the merger on. Uh, this leads me to a question which has been articulated by one of your uh, peers in, in Concurrence podcast, uh, Frederick Genie, in one of the recent uh, roundtable, OECD roundtables, namely the relationship between competition policy and something which was for quite a long time kind of taboo, uh, industrial policy, new industrial policy. And there were several suggestions in this roundtable by Bill Kovacic, among others, that, uh, you know, the, the, the ideas of industrial policy uh, and the relationship of, with competition policy can be not necessarily antagonistic, so to say, that there are opportunities to somehow to square that and to, to bring them in the common denominator, conceptually at least. So can you elaborate on this place, on, on the relationship between competition policy and industrial policy? Yes. Um, also a wonderful question, and it's coming onto the scene much more. And I think South Africa is one of the best examples of thinking and intellectual leadership on showing how market-friendly industrial policy is actually a necessary part of their competition policy, that they need government to come in in certain ways to bolster emerging businesses. And so there is market-friendly industrial policy to do that. And there's a lot of that in South Africa and there's a lot written on it too. And then there's also the kind of industrial policy that we, were all, we all learned to hate, um, which is a country investing in promoting its own powerful champions that because of its market power will do better strategically in the world. So most antitrust people, do have this belief of being against the strategic power boosting industrial policy with externalities. Um, China does, does not. So China does believe in industrial policy, including boosting the power of Chinese firms. That actually is a point of perturbation in the world, a, a thorn in the side in the world with US and EU saying that's not legitimate and it's unfair and you're trying to get ahead by building up your market or monopoly power and submerging the rest of us. I think that is a fight that's gonna continue where China is going to, of course, continue what it's doing. And the West is going to keep pointing out that it is doing this and claiming it is unfair. But there's no discipline on that. There's no WTO discipline on that that says you can't use industrial policy to bolster your national champions. Even though it's theoretically against the spirit of the WTO. Because there is a spirit as a WTO, which is, in that sense, level playing field for competition. You compete on the merits and not strategically, except in pockets of behavior that they might spell out. The next question is uh, on digital sense of stricto, so to say. So it's, you know, we probably a little bit discussions about digital, the, uh, the, the, the new proposals on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, which aim to recalibrate the very modality, the very vision, how the big tech industry is being, is being regulated and the, 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 the having numerous uh, spillover effects on the, the whole business, vertically, perhaps even horizontally, if, if you're ambitious enough. We have several, we have one model in the, in, in, in the EU with the Digital Markets Act proposal uh, in the trilogue stage pretty much. So it's, uh, you know, we, we, we don't know details to where it will lead us, but, but 90, 95% of the structure of the very architecture is pretty much known. We know a little bit less in terms of confidence about the UK Digital Markets Unit, but still we understand the mechanics. Uh, many in, in, in Europe know less about the uh, US proposals uh, we have now in the, in, 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 in the house and also unprecedented um, activities by both antitrust enforcers or mainly FTC and also by state uh, advocate general. So it's quite 
as well as by uh, president's um, uh, order, executive order. So it's quite, um, you know, you, you need to be an expert in this specific field to, to try to synchronize the, these different attempts. And you are one of those experts. So leaving aside European uh, uh, and UK, I still uh, try to feel it difficult to say European and UK um, approaches to things. Can you elaborate more on the US uh, uh, initiatives, please? Yes. So um, as you've said, we have first our president's executive order, and then we have um, individuals who are neo Brandeis leaning, who are now in key positions in the agencies. And we have our legislature, which has put, out, put forward um, a large number of bills. I think it's more than 10 bills that cover aspects of digital. Uh, the president's executive order basically says, we want more competition, we need more competition, we need it across many different fields. And I'm looking to the various agencies to implement a program that will put more competition into the market. The order does not have any particular immediate effects. It's not like an order to do this, to introduce a um, scheme of controlling the specific, specifically controlling the power of the digital firms. So it's handing it over to the agencies and sort of being behind them, backing them up and saying, go. Uh, then we have Federal Trade Commission, um, which is headed by Lena Khan, who is one of the original and very serious scholarly um, people in the Nia Brandeis group. And she definitely wants to make a change. And she wants to control power of big tech. And she does believe, and this is clear from her work, uh, including both her scholarly work and her work at our House of Representatives, um, she believes that the big tech firms, often we can say GAFA, I mean, that's only four, um, but there are five or six, but we can call them GAFA. Um, she believes that they are abusing, that they have huge power and they are abusing their power. Uh, so, the Federal Trade Commission has brought an action against Facebook. In fact, it brought the action under the Trump administration. The federal court dismissed the case saying you didn't show us enough that Facebook has monopoly because that's a first screen ingredient of a successful con conduct action against single firm action in the United States. That's a Sherman Act, section two, which prohibits monopolization. That's the closest we get to your abuse of dominance. Um, and so the first screen is you must show that the firm has monopoly. The court threw it out and said, you didn't give me enough information to know that Facebook has monopoly. Even as a first cut, the FTC under Lena Khan filed an amended complaint and now has just alleged enough. The court said last week, this few days ago, the court said, yeah, you've alleged enough so that you can go to the next stage of discovery in this case, which will probably take years. The court didn't say that, but certainly implies it. Um, and, and so I deny Facebook's motion to dismiss. That's what the court said a couple of days ago. Um, that case is kind of a good example to say, um, more word about what's gonna happen in the United States. That case will take years. It's mostly now, given what the judge did on throwing out some causes of action, it's about Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram, which was in 2012 and 2014. And in the United States, we do have the ability to contest mergers after they have closed, after they have happened on grounds that they have contributed significant market power. And that's gonna be the factual question in those cases, whether those acquisitions, which were of teeny startups at that time, contributed significantly to Facebook's 
so-called monopoly power and indeed whether it has monopoly power. And by the time the case gets to trial, will it still have monopoly power? Um, uh, Facebook says, of course, this is a very dynamic market. Snapchat and, and others are very important competitors right now. Who knows what kind of power we'll have when the case gets to trial. And then the case will go to trial. It will almost surely get appealed. By the time it gets to the Supreme Court, it will be at least eight years from now. It will be old. The markets will probably have changed. Um, this is the fate of the actions, so those actions that are in court. This is the probable fate of those actions that are in court now, not only by FTC against Facebook, by DOJ against Google. And the states, as you've mentioned, almost every state of the United States has joined in both of those, have, have filed their own similar parallel actions against Facebook and against Google. In the Google action by our Department of Justice, the people might not realize that action against Google doesn't, um, DOJ against Google, it doesn't even contest self-preferencing because that's probably not a violation in the United States today. That uh, there is no such thing as a violation where you're using monopoly power just to give you competitive advantage you have to show the likelihood of monopolizing that adjacent market. So in a Google case, shopping, you'd have to show that if Google prefers itself in the shopping uh, queries, that, it, that that act is giving it, en route to giving it monopoly power in comparative shopping, which it's probably not, and which it didn't need to do to be a violation in the EU. Um, so so the, that, that is to say, the US against Google, that's Justice Department action, it's US against, it's always US against if it's from the Department of Justice. US against Google is actually a pretty modest action. It's not a self-preferencing action. It calls out certain conduct which could be held illegal where Google is trying to get all players like Apple to have Google as the default mechanism on their device. Uh, but that's modest compared with big preferencing actions and big actions uh, in the EU that are suppressing interoperability, for example. The state's actions in Google include self-preferencing, but that's not likely to win. And then you have there'll be a trial in a couple of years and the appeals and the same thing I said with Facebook. So I do not have a lot of hope that these legal actions, which I think should have been brought, um, even though they have a slim chance of success ultimately in our Supreme Court, which is very, very conservative and is of that laissez-faire view of antitrust. So, so that's one thing. Those are the cases in court. And then for FTC, FTC might try some rulemaking. Um, they have some power of rulemaking. There's a serious question whether they have power of antitrust rulemaking. They definitely have power of consumer protection and deception rulemaking. Um, they will probably try to use their power of rulemaking to say that certain acts are illegal, could be self-referencing, it could be um, standing in the way of interoperability, and it could even be um, big tech dominant platforms acquiring potential competitors. Um, so there's some question whether they can do the rulemaking and then they have to have rulemaking period of time. It's possible they could do some rulemaking, um, even though it will be up for challenge as to their power to do it. I actually think that they ought to because I think going case by case through the courts is a losing proposition. Uh, time is against you. And these firms, the big tech firms are doing a whole bunch of practices. EU, you can say 18, is it? You have a list in your DMA of 18, but I would narrow it down to say, you know, five or, six or seven 
practices are doing that to me are definitely for stalling competition, trying to prevent the competition. They can be separated out. They can be articulated just as they are in the DMA. And they are also in um, the CMA, in the UK enforcement um, against big tech platforms. And I think that is a promising way to control power of big tech. Um, right now in the United States, uh, the big tech firms say, I can do all these things. I can cut off the data of a rival on my platform because it's fine under US antitrust law. In other words, it's wild west, we used to call it. Um, they can do what they want under US law. They can probably do what they want um, because of our lenient law. And they do that a little more with discretion today because they know they're under the microscope, um, but, and, and that it's bad public relations to say, oh, I just cut off this rival on my platform because it was getting too good. They don't want to say that. They don't want to have to live up to it. But they're thinking I can do it consistent with the US antitrust law. And unless there are rules that say, no, you can't, they'll keep doing it in a more subtle way because they don't want the public to know that this is the kind of thing they do. So then there's the legislation. And I also, I should come back to the DOJ. I'll, I'll do DOJ right now. We have a new head of the DOJ. His name is Jonathan Cantor. I do not think that, I do not know whether he's associated with Neo Brandeis. He's certainly sort of liberal progressive. And it's possible that he will think of his job as most assistant uh, attorney generals in charge of antitrust have done as an enforcement job, given the law, given the tools, and he'll be more aggressive than some have been, some heads have been, because he might see market power more clearly and its use and abuse more clearly than some other heads have been. Um, and doing the enforcement track, which is under our antitrust law, which is conservative. So that's how I see the DOJ. FTC, I see as much more aggressive activists trying to be. There are five people who are commissioners. There are three who are Democratic. Um, the Democrats will usually support Lena Khan and the Republicans will usually not, but sometimes they're all on board. Depending on what the issue is, they can be all on board. On the very progressive initiatives, the Republicans will not be on board. And the actions that will be taken, which might be rulemaking, uh, will probably be very controversial. And then there's legislature. Uh, so Amy Klobuchar, the senator, um, is one of the people way out in front in legislation to control big tech. And there are a number of bills, as I've said, and they break out into doing the following. There's a bill, Klobuchar Grassley, which is against self-preferencing, but only if it is, this is what the bill says, unfair self-preferencing that hurts the market. That can actually end up being a conservative dream world uh, that, you know, what is unfair and what hurts the market. Um, so the self, that's the self-preferencing bill. Um, and of all of these bills, there are House and Senate counterparts. So David Cicilline has the counterpart, introduced the counterpart ahead of her in the House of Representatives. Um, there are bills on, relating to mergers of two sorts. One sort would basically say the big platforms cannot make any mergers of any firm, even a startup, that looks like it's a competitor or potential competitor without a, just, a clear proof and justification that this will not harm competition. And this is understood to mean there's almost a ban on big tech acquisitions uh, because it will almost have that effect. It will make it really difficult for them to acquire the startups that they want. And then there's another merger bill that would shift the burden on very big mergers and require justification. 
so it would make it much harder for very big mergers to go through. And then there is a bill that Klobuchar introduced, which was more omnibus, um, trying to change the standard, getting at a very conservative law and trying to make it easier to prove violations um, so that the assumptions that all this is good for consumers, that all of the acts, even exclusionary acts are good for consumers, that that assumption is taken away, she would make it much easier to prove exclusionary conduct. Within those bills, well, I, I might say there's another bill as to the breakups. Uh, there's one bill, Jayapal's bill, which would, in effect, it would break up gatekeepers that run platforms from doing business on their platform. That's basically the panoply of legislation. Nobody knows how likely it is for any of this legislation to get through. Some of it is bipartisan, which of course makes it much more likely, but our Congress is so dysfunctional and the lobbying right now of big tech is huge. And of course it's, it involves giving money, um, contributions, campaign contributions, et cetera, to legislators, but it also involves the intellectual exercise of bringing out the other side of the story of the effect that these bills will have on competition in the market. And so they are telling the narrative, which is the intellectual side that leave these firms alone, they're doing fine. And if these bills are enacted, there'll be high costs that consumers will no longer get what they want cost of things will go up. I also noticed in this, uh, in the on the latest point when observing the discussions on the DMA, which I am familiar more, uh, that uh, one of the strategies, uh, one of the strategies of lobbyists is to introduce amendments to the proposal, which look, you know, empowering consumers or which have very nice you know, uh, facade, so to say, but which disarm this very sophisticated and you know, mutual uh, uh, toolkit, the uh, proposal from its uh, explicit but also secret uh, po power. Um, so this is just a, a replica. But uh, co coming to the question, um, this links us uh, uh, very well to the first one with which we started uh, our conversations on the goals. Obviously, we see that, that there is kind of a change of modality. We we, we move or we complement the restorative uh, approach to, to, to exposed competition uh, enforcement to a little bit more proactive um, uh, way, which envisages a greater role of agencies to shape competition policy, not only to protect it, uh, it but also at least potentially to, to, to direct it in a, specific, in, a specific, in a specific way. Do you think that this uh, requires a change or a revision or assessment of our approach to goals of competition or would it, would it have an impact on, on these kind of more theoretical questions of the goals or we still can operate this new modality within the, 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 the traditional uh, theoretical frameworks, normative framework? Certainly in Europe, the agencies are either have or getting or exercising more power to develop the theories, as well as the enforcement of rules against power. Um, in the United States, if the FTC has rulemaking power, that would fit within your picture. Um, there, it's not clear that they do have rulemaking power in antitrust, but if they do, it would certainly fit. Apart from that, our agencies do not have the power that the European agencies have. And they don't, also they don't get the deference that the European agencies get. So if you look at the very recent judgment of the general court in the Google shopping case, um, you can see how much deference the court is giving to DigiComp and the commission and saying, well, they did have a basis. They had a rational basis for coming to this conclusion, which is some mix of fact, law, and policy. 
in the United States, you're not going to see that as the lodestar for um, affirming or dismissing a case. The court's going to jump in and say, I don't like that policy. Uh, they wouldn't say it that way. That policy is not good antitrust. They would be second guessing. So the agency does not have any bit of the power to chart the road into the future of antitrust. In, in one of your latest articles with, with a co-author with, with Harry First, I think you propose the, for FTC to have more kind of strategic perhaps, yeah, uh, rule making, but also rule enforcing power. So this, uh, is it your, right. your still view? Yeah, that is right. And I think you asked also, how does that fit into the world picture? If agencies seem to have more power to chart the path of antitrust, um, and there's an interesting step there to be taken. Uh, one sees immediately EU and UK are not on the same page. They're on a lot of the same page, but, but they actually do it differently. And they both want to do the same thing. They both want to get these new forms of power that are doing certain abusive acts the UK is a little more flexible in saying, I want to talk to each of the big tech platforms and look at the model of each, assuming the model is actually trying to get the best thing for consumers um, and work with them and not prohibit more than would be acceptable to help make their model work. And the, EU is more peremptory saying, we know these practices are abusive and they are prohibited. And those are two different ways of looking at it. Even that is very far from the United States who hasn't gotten near that. Um, so thinking about the world and thinking about your last question was about the effect of having this agency power to make the policy. Um, there's some kind of clash in the world, and there's some kind of clash even in, in Europe and UK, and even potentially Germany, which has its own rules that are, but it has to be consistent. It, at least it has to call them consistent with EU rules, and that might be a question. So what's gonna happen on control of these practices in the world? Is there a way for the world to reach any kind of consensus? Um, that would be extremely difficult. I think a lot of the world is adopting either what EU or UK is doing and that way of thinking and thinking leadership of how to control this power that you don't control by saying, I only wanna see whether output is limited. That's what US is doing. You can't control it that way. So I think that's a real issue for the world thinking about that. And I think a lot of agencies like um, like South Korea is emulating EU more or less. Everybody's more or less. And is that gonna matter that we end up with a, it might be a crazy quilt of rules that big tech is going to say, this is very inefficient for us to try to follow and almost impossible for us to follow. And we've got to follow the one that's most restrictive but the one that's most restrictive is not the best. Um, that presents some world problems. I don't see them overwhelming though. I think that, for example, probably big tech can follow EU rules and EU rules might be the most restrictive. And then the question is whether technologically they can segregate markets and follow EU rules in Europe and not in the United States and the rest of the world. If they can do that, they will. If they can do that, they'll keep hurting South Africa, Africa, you know, they'll keep hurting the vulnerable. And, and they'll also keep doing the practices that US might say it's not even a, a harm. Uh, but I can see that it's diversity in the world. It's not so bad. It's probably the best we can do right now. But I think there ought to be more world conversations. There ought, there, we definitely need a forum for leaders in competition all over the world that have some control that are either heads of their agencies or some um, control over agencies, some significant position in agencies to 
put their heads together to think about a global norms. Are there any global norms that come out of this? Even notionally, we're not going to get a rule for the world, but notionally global norms that, for example, maybe everybody can agree that there are forms of power less than what we call dominance or monopoly, where firms are exercising power. And there are some conducts that are impermissible, uh, such as dominant gatekeeper platform cutting off at the pass, the innovative rival. Um, some rules that everybody will say, yeah, this is bad conduct and we can agree to it. And we will do what we can to incorporate or implement it in our jurisdiction. Okay, and uh, this connects me perfectly to the question which I wanted to ask you, um, probably the one of the last questions. Um, judging, let's say, five years from, from today, obviously it depends on, on, on my previous question on what we expect, what should be the criterion of success or, or, or performance? Are we satisfied with what we wanted to achieve in 2022? Uh, by looking at it in 2027 or 32. Um, but obviously we can say that one of the criteria could be a, a better competition inside uh, ecosystems or platforms and more ambitious perhaps uh, kind of to, to open up markets uh, horizontally uh, for, uh, to allow comp uh, competition for what we call in, in EU parlance core platform services. Yeah, for this quintessential uh, elements of, of the digital economy, search engines, uh, social networks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But okay, so this is kind of assuming that. Uh, do, so my question is: Are you optimistic? Do you think that the the enforcers and legislators have the ability and skills and intellectual capacity to outperform the the those who are the kind of native speakers in the in in technology and who are much more advanced in their kind of vision or strategic planning, et cetera. So how design, not only the narratives, but how to design our conduct as we all understand it now. So in other words, the question is, um, do you think that we will have, is it likely to have kind of G GDPR um, fatigue effect or something which, which, which many people say that look GDPR, we were so enthusiastic and, and excited about this uh, proposal changing the, the, the world paradigmatically. And obviously we have incremental improvements, but it didn't change the strategic kind of picture, uh, so to say. What is your, what does your crystal ball tell uh, you and ask, uh, and ask uh, about the, 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 the chances of this new wave of, of proactive legislation to change this, uh, this industry and this universe or multiverse uh, significantly? Oh, so that's a really good question and involves, as you just said, knowing enough technology, information that do the agencies that are trying to control certain conduct have enough information to know what they're doing. Um, so it, moving into this age does mean that the agencies and the enforcers who are the brains of going forward in certain areas have to be technologically much more astute. They, absent that, they have to have technologically astute people who are at their elbow telling them, yes, for example, yes, Google could have a neutral paradigm for search without interfering with its innovation going forward. I mean, they would have to ha be able to generalize that way uh, because I think if we did have such a brainstorming of people of the world, that's what we would all want. I mean, we would all want to unleash the innovation and to control the bad conduct that is abusive and might even be hurting more innovation. You need a lot of information on technology to know what that is. I think that the CMA UK system is positioned to get that kind of information by there being more sensitive to the business model of each of the platforms before they do decide to enforce um, certain rules against certain conduct. Um, so, 
going, thinking five or 10 years hence, where will we be? You know, when I predict, I, I feel very conservative. When I predict for the United States, I think it's, it's extremely unlikely that we'll get legislation that will be aggressive and will, it's all, and the legislation is all about cases and that will really help the case move fast and come to a conclusion and come to a good conclusion fast. Um, it might be that some of the legislation gets passed. I forgot to say, there's also funding legislation to fund the agencies better. That's needed and it's uncontroversial and, and might very well happen. Um, but that's just an aside. I forgot to say that before. Um, but even if that preferencing legislation gets passed, it has so much to be determined that will bog down the courts for years and years. So when I think of what's gonna happen in the United States, I think the bet that things will be more the same than more different is probably the bet I would make. Um, and that not much legislation will get passed, but if it gets passed, it will have enough weasel words that will let the big tech term, firms tie up the courts for years. And so that's a very negative prediction. Um, in the rest of the world, I, I see the rest of the world as moving forward in line with either the EU or the UK model. And therefore trying to control the power of big tech, especially in its most abusive forms. So I do think that coming back to the US, that marshalling the, the thoughts, it's the intellectual leadership. I think we do need that. I think it's very important. I think even if we don't move off the dime in terms of our Supreme Court still there, it's very conservative, it's going to continue to be there. Um, even if we don't get those huge changes in the law, I think that the change of rhetoric and the intellectual leadership in laying out what are the problems and what are the solutions is very, very important. And I, I do applaud its going forward. Excellent. Thank you very much, Eleanor. My last question, obviously I wanted to ask you uh, if, if, if we can agree to meet in, in 2027 or 2032 to check how how many of your predictions, yeah, put it in your diary, please. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> yes. So, okay. but my last uh, question, which is probably less related to the substance, but this is um, to, to the substance of our conversation, but it has significant spillover effect for, for uh, uh, our students who are much more, you know, who feel much more organically in this digital, universe and obviously not only not only in the digital sphere um, they live in a very you know turbulent world on the, and they they are graduating in, in a very turbulent world which offers many many opportunities but also is very challenging due to pandemics tragic pandemics and all the rest of, of, of unknown uh, unknowns what would be your recommendation or suggestion uh, for those who just at the beginning of their academic or maybe practical career doing antitrust in uh, who will be defining the antitrust policy in the following decades uh, how would you uh, provide them with a friendly uh, authoritative advice oh so i would say to them you live in some of the most interesting times that you my students you are on the verge of we, the change is happening all around us. There are ideas waiting to happen, um, laws, rules, concepts waiting to be implemented, uh, that, that you are the ones who can channel the thinking for the next generation. And, and the world is open to do that. I mean, whether it's writing the articles that some of you will probably write or whether it is leading an agency or whether it is defending a firm that is the big tech firm. Um, you know so much more than we do about the technology. You're kind of better able to learn and understand the technology, to know what firms can do 
that's good for advancing technology that will help people and to know the kind of abuses that they don't have to do in order to carry out their business of business. So it's a great position to be in today. Eleanor Fox, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you very much, Eli. It's a pleasure. Thank you.